just made history. From history makers of today. Good morning, I'm Dr. Coleman. History is being made by cutting edge health professionals. When I entered the room, I could tell that they were surprised that I looked the way I looked. To the home of African American history right here in Philadelphia. History is being built from the ground up. It is all about opportunity, access, and experience. This is our NBC10 special celebrating Black History Month. It's past, it's present, and it's future. And we're serving it up right now. <laughs> NBC10 celebrates Black History Month. Locally sponsored by Keystone First. Keystone First, putting you first. This is the African American Museum in Philadelphia at the corner of 7th and Arch, celebrating its 40th year this year. And it's also the home of our NBC 10 special, celebrating Black History Month. And we welcome you inside this fantastic museum over the next half hour, stories of African American history makers, both past and present. I'm Erin Coleman. And I'm Jacqueline London. We begin with one of the most influential leaders of the arts in Philadelphia, dancer, entrepreneur, and recipient of the nation's highest civic honor. Meet Joan Myers Brown, who formed Philadenko and influenced thousands of young lives in the process. <laughs> I always say, I don't have dance, dance has me. Joan Myers Brown, Aunt Joan to those who dance on these floors, lives and breathes dance. I thought I was gonna be the last great black ballerina, it didn't happen. A dream denied because of the color of her skin. As much as Joan loved ballet, growing up there were no schools where she could get quality dance training. They were all segregated. So in 1960, she opened her own school in West Philadelphia for African-American dancers to turn their dreams into reality. Philadanka was born and continues to prosper. How important is it for you to give back to Philadelphia? Well, I was raised in the era of segregation. So having the opportunity to give others what I missed out on is important to me. It makes me feel good for the dancers that come back and say what I've done for them. You know, Leslie Odom was one of my dancers. Lee Daniels was one of my dancers. A wall of fame showcases those who have danced through her school and company. A wall she walks past numerous times a day as she continues her climb to the top. My office is on the third floor. I go up, I must go up and down 50 times a day. And my doctor says I should rest, I shouldn't work so hard, but I, it doesn't bother me. I just, I think he thinks of my age more than anything else, but I don't. I just do what I have to do. At 85 years old, slowing down is not in her genes. Perfection is. Her students are reminded of it every time Aunt Joan is watching. Like when she's not in the room, we're just dancing, we're calm. The moment she steps in the room, we're like this. Okay, we gotta hit it, we gotta hit it, we gotta hit it, we gotta hit it. Many dancers say the audition at Philadanko is the hardest audition they've ever had. I just wanna see, can you cut it? The standards just as high as the heels with Aunt Joan setting the tone. Well, most days I get here quarter to nine and most nights I leave 11.30, 12, one o'clock. 15 hour days every day, her efforts not going unnoticed. In 2012, President Obama awarded Joan Myers Brown with the nation's highest civic honor for the arts. I tried not to cry, so I just was smiling. <laughs> but it was wonderful. We got the whole wide world. Continuing her dream one day, world. one dancer at a time. And we move from the finesse of dance to the power of construction. As the Philadelphia landscape continues to evolve, one center city firm is garnering national attention to help make that happen. Angelo Perryman leads one of the most sought after construction companies in the Delaware Valley. He is literally breaking new ground and barriers all at the same time. <laughs> 
they start growing out of the ground and, and then you're all proud of everything that you end up doing. This is what Angelo Perryman lives for, construction from the foundation up. Welcome to Happy Hollow, a recent project from Mural Arts Philadelphia. As an African American artist, it's very valuable to me to be able to portray positive images of African Americans. It has a great impact, not only on the community, but on the young men and women that's involved in the program because it makes them feel uh, accepted again. It makes them feel a part of the community again. It gives you a sense of uh, direction and you're leading people in the right direction and you're doing the right thing. Those are just some of the remarkable images across the city, courtesy of Mural Arts Philadelphia. Welcome back to this NBC 10 celebration of Black History Month. I'm Erin Coleman here at the African American Museum. This place is a treasure trove of African American history. Here's just a sampling. William Still was born in New Jersey, but he was a member of the Vigilance Committee, and the Vigilance Committee was a vital part of the Underground Railroad. What's Patricia Wilson Aiden is the president and CEO of the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Stories of the African American experience are the foundation of this remarkable place. We're located just two blocks away from the Liberty Bell, so so many of our visitors come to the museum as part of their exploration of Philadelphia's history and the formative years of this country. The challenges faced by African Americans in those formative years of our nation are captured in the museum's main exhibit, Audacious Freedom. Audacious Freedom is our core exhibit. And Audacious Freedom tells the story of the heroes that contributed to the founding of this country. There are plenty of well-known figures here. So you'll see Harriet Tubman and you'll see Frederick Douglass. But we also want to identify those people that are specific to African American history in Philadelphia. So here in our core exhibit, Audacious Freedom, we do concentrate on history, but we want to ensure that we tell stories that have contemporary res relevance as well. Two brand new photographic exhibits examine the contemporary in unique ways. One's called Harlem USA, and it's a historic look at Harlem by Dio Bay, who is one of the pioneers of African American photography. We're pairing that with the Church of Broken Pieces. Both of those exhibits look at African American neighborhoods and African American identities. We can't just talk about culture, we want to talk about art. We want to present the beauty of the African American experience, as well as those really tough stories that come along with our history. Similar tough stories are being written today for people of all races, and in many cases, particularly African Americans. That's part of our charge. We want to present the story of African Americans' presence in America in an unvarnished way. That's the only way that we can teach our children the integrity of the story. The youngest among us can get to know the many faces of this special place, especially now. Black History Month is the highlight of our year. We get so many visitors who are coming here because they understand that this is the month that they can really get in touch with African American history. From a building rich in history to a new building that aims to showcase America's pastime to our next generation. The Phillies Urban Youth Academy allows kids to play ball all year long with eyes on revitalizing baseball in cities like Philadelphia. Nice and easy. The familiar sounds of baseball. There you go. Shared with the next generation. There you go. This is the Marian Anderson Recreation Center in South Philly. 
Ryan Howard christened the baseball portion of the building a year ago. Negro League stars and the man who broke Major League Baseball's color barrier, Jackie Robinson, are honored here. But African-American involvement in big league baseball is at historic lows. Last opening day, just 8% of baseball's players were black. 30 years ago, that number was more than double. The Ryan Howard Training Center is making a grassroots effort to change that. I feel like I'm ready for the upcoming high school season. I really want to do great, and this facility has provided me with the tools to be great. Meet Damani Okori of Philly's West Oak Lane. He travels to South Philly at least twice a week to play. Baseball is his passion. Any man can succeed or fail at this sport. The best man hits 300. It's three out of 10 times you're succeeding. The Phillies know exposure to baseball can create a lifelong love affair with the game. So on Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, they sent one of their top young talents to be their ambassador. There you go, good job. Good job, man. I hope I'm making a good impact on them, man, and uh, I hope they uh, take some out of it. Parents like Bernard Carter definitely are getting something out of it. This major league facility and training are making a real difference. What you really want to see is kids who love the game, the ones who are coming out and yelling at their TV and coming to the games to really be able to advance and, you know, improve their skills and have the pros come back, you know, and give the kids, you know, some pointers on how they can get to where they are. You know, it's invaluable. It's a blessing. And, uh... Just, just to get to talk to the kids, man, it's a great, it's a great thing, a great opportunity, man, and uh, I'm loving it, man, I'm loving every minute of it. Still to come. You have every single race film. This woman is a living encyclopedia of history. Her story next, as this NBC10 celebration of Black History Month continues. This is the pasta that's going to go in as the noodles. Talk about an undertaking. Keith Lucas is the executive chef at MANA, a nonprofit based in Philadelphia that serves medically appropriate meals to people battling life threatening illnesses. Keith has been with the organization for almost two decades and currently oversees production of one million meals a year. A number made even more impressive when you consider the many dietary needs he needs to service. You almost have to be like a food scientist to like kind of put this thing together and, and figure out who can get what, how do you have to make it, what can you take out to make it good for everybody. Looks delicious. By the way, Keith's workload will double later this year when MANA moves to its new location. Moving on now to the influence of black cinema and a Mount Airy curator with a vast collection of films. A collection so impressive that a thousand of its items are now housed in the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History. Meet Dr. Beverly Richards and her most prized possessions. Stormy weather. Lena Horne acting and singing during an era of elegance in stormy weather but stormy times were just as prevalent. Dr. Beverly Richards, owner and curator of A Cinema Apart, a collection of black film memorabilia, recounts what the most well-known black actors of the 1920s to 50s endured, everyone from Lena Horne to Dorothy Dandridge. She was performing there and she went to um, take a dip in the pool. She put her toe in and they drained the pool. Lena Horne, the same thing. She stopped at a roadside cafe to go in and when she came in, they told her that they couldn't serve her, but they asked for her autograph. <sighs> those were the times. Those were the times. Remembering those times with a collection of more than 3,000 photographs, films, and movie posters, all in her Mount Airy home. It was the passion of Dr. Richard's late husband, Larry. She now continues his dream of collecting and educating on early black films. Yes. Do you realize the magnitude of what you have here? Absolutely, every day. <laughs> the collection she owns is extremely rare, valuable, and perfectly preserved. If I don't have it here, then it probably doesn't exist. All of the items she's collected, highly coveted. Lots of jewelry from Dorothy Dandridge and Lena Horne. I have a wonderful bracelet from Josephine Baker. Uh, lingerie of Dorothy Dandridge's. What is your favorite item in this house? 
without a doubt, Josephine Baker's red mink cape. And oh. I keep threatening to wear it out, but I won't. You have I the won't. red mink cape? I have the red mink cape. We're going to have yes. to try that on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 1,000 of Dr. Richard's pieces are on display at the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History, where she was at the grand opening with her husband in hand. Knowing that this is what he really wanted and how thrilled he would be, how absolutely thrilled and proud. And back to that favorite prize possession of hers. Do you feel like Josephine Baker? Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, very French and exotic, French American, French African American. Do you think there's one central theme after watching all of these race films that people walk away with? I think it's pride. I think it's pride. About love. Dr. Richard says she feels like the keeper of history and travels the world lecturing and showcasing her collection. Still to come on this NBC10 celebration of Black History Month. We profile a trailblazing woman whose work with babies in the womb is part of a team that's earning international acclaim as we wrap up this NBC 10 celebration of Black History Month. Next. We just made history! <laughs> that was the scene this past November as Lisa Blunt Rochester did in fact make history. She became the first woman and first African-American to represent Delaware in the United States Congress. Here's the Congresswoman on the path she's blazing. I get a lot of questions about what does it feel like to make history? And many times I've said I really don't understand that question because you just do the work. Uh, but this Martin Luther King holiday, when I was going through looking at different quotes, I came across a quote I'd never seen before, uh, which basically says that we are not history makers, we're made by history. And finally, on the subject of history makers, we bring you the story of Dr. Beverly Coleman, a story full of firsts as a pioneer in the field of radiology. And right now at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, she is at the forefront of groundbreaking medicine that is diagnosing and operating on unborn babies still in the womb. Good morning, I'm Dr. Coleman. I'm a baby. Every day, Dr. Beverly Coleman is on a mission to find out what's really going on inside mothers-to-be. These patients have been told um, that during their pregnancy, something was seen that wasn't good. So they come from all over the world to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in search of answers, and virtually all of them go through her. This is an extremely difficult time for the families. And unfortunately, I give a lot more bad news than I give good news. Here is a fetal nose. But some days, there is good news. That's my best day, when a family has been told, you have a cyst on the brain. And I look at it and I say, the brain is totally normal. Last year, I had a patient who was sent uh, for a possible neck mass. And it was just a baby with a lot of body hair. So you can imagine that the mom was ecstatic. You can feel her passion. Her colleagues say quite simply, she can see what others can't, somehow making sense of what isn't always crystal clear. When she says something is there or something is not there, you can take it to the bank. Take it to the bank. You can, it's on the money all the time. She's not wrong. Dr. Scott Adzik is the surgeon in chief at Children's. He operates on babies still in the womb, based on what Dr. Coleman tells him is there. If she has reservations, we don't do it. She's the best at what she does. Perhaps because she's been doing ultrasound since it was invented in the 1970s, starting out at the University of Pennsylvania. But she says it hasn't always been easy. Over the years, she's had patients question her ability. When I entered the room, I could tell that they were surprised that I looked the way I looked. And she's consistently been one of the first and few African Americans in the nation among her peers, then and even now. In this day and age, you don't want to be the only one in the room. You want to be able to share your expertise with someone who you feel will continue what you try to do. 
But for Coleman, it always comes back to the medicine. Last year, she became one of the first black female doctors at Children's to have an endowed chair in her name. And while she's used to working with moms, she's a mom herself, mine, which makes telling her story a little extra special. I feel at the end of the day, if I can say that I help someone along the way, then my living will not be in vain. You know, she told me one of the really nice moments for her was when a couple so thankful that their baby was okay decided to name him after her. His name is Cole. Oh, such a great story. I love that she's your mom. The one and only. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this NBC10 Celebration of Black History Month special. Thanks so much for watching.